All right, so this is Mark Ferner who's going to talk about confocal microscopy. Hi, thank you for sticking around instead of going for beer. Um, so I do want to talk a bit about uh, some methods for automating some quantitative analysis of confocal microscopy images. Uh, this is work I've done with a, another Fenner. It uh, happens to be my wife. Uh, she sort of handles the wet lab side of things, and I sort of handle the silicon bit bite side of things. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of context. I'm going to primarily talk about data wrangling, but I do want to let you know what's going on with the biology. Uh, we are dealing with confocal microscopy images, and a sample of uh, a piece of one of those is in the top left there. Uh, to the right is a schematic diagram of the same situation. And what we are looking at is we have three things of interest, uh, two proteins and one set of locations. And we're trying to put these things together with what, where, and when. The what are these two proteins. I'll get, talk about them in a second. Uh, the where are uh, a set of organelles. Those are substructures within a cell. And the when is a uh, time course over about two hours of experimentation. So uh, the two proteins that we have of interest, one is pretty well known, BDNF, uh, and that is in red. And the other is the whole reason we're doing this study, uh, the green uh, is indicating the uh, tyrosine kinase receptor B, a uh, particular isoform of that protein. And science, we, as in science as a whole, doesn't really know what this protein does, and we're trying to get some information on it. Uh, uh, just a quick note on the organelles, and, and after this slide, I'm basically going to talk about red, blue, and green. So if you're not into cellular biology, hopefully you can dig colors. Um, uh, the organelles are endosomes, lysosomes, and uh, transport vesicles. So that's the context. So uh, confocal images are wonderful for many reasons, uh, but like many images, they come with some problems. And among those uh, is the issue of background noise. Uh, what we're uh, doing to deal with some of that background noise is to threshold the images. And that is to set a particular bar. Any uh, intensity values below that bar get thrown out. This is done on a channel by channel basis. Uh, here on the uh, left, sort of the middle of the screen, you see the original images, raw images, and to the right, uh, you see some images after they've been thresholded by our expert, aka the other part of our dynamic duel. Um, uh, some typical sources of the background noise in confocal microscopy uh, can come from autofluorescence, I'll talk more about that in a second, uh, from scatter and also from uh, experimental detection uh, type artifacts. Uh, the lower set of the images here is the green channel, and that's particularly uh, important to talk about because autofluorescence, uh, that is uh, light that's coming back from the cellular sample itself, is maximized in the green channel. So we have an extra source of noise there that, that needs to be dealt with. Uh, the arrows here are indicating a location where there's a good bit of just low level green channel background noise, and uh, hopefully, take my word for it, or look at the arrows, uh, that is removed at the point the arrow is indicating. So uh, this is a conference about scientific Python, and how did we end up using it? Well, it turns out that uh, manually thresholding uh, 933 images, uh, this was the number of images we uh, developed in the course of our experimentation, uh, manually thresholding 933 images on three channels, so approximately you know 2,700 uh, rounds of doing thresholding, is not necessarily appealing to uh, a biological scientist, uh, particularly if there aren't uh, poor graduate students running around. Um, the, it's possible to do this thresholding, for example, in uh, Photoshop or in some more uh, domain-specific packages, image J or Metamorph. Uh, but to do these individually, you have to take sliders in a GUI, wiggle them around, and say, I like how this looks. Um, we wanted to see if we could do a little bit better than that and see if we could learn the implicit function that the expert was using to do this uh, thresholding. So uh, talk very briefly about uh, how we came up with an automated me method for doing the thresholding. Uh, essentially, we developed a, a very small linear model, simple linear regression model, uh, from a subset of the images. Uh, in, our experimental in our experimental conditions, we had uh, six replications. And so we basically said, OK, we're going to take one of those replicates for each condition and uh, do it by hand. And so uh, we did that. More to the point, my colleague did that. And uh, that gave us a very nice training set. Uh, with that training set, then we uh, spent some time developing a linear model going from these images. We did some feature extraction. I can talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, 
uh, went from the images to the thresholds, and we came up with a pretty good model. And then we realized we weren't quite sure how well that model was doing because that was our training set. And uh, if you're familiar with machine learning, although all those people are at the machine learning and peer event, um, you also need to test your model and, and have some uh, validation of the predictive accuracy of it. Uh, so uh, we ended up mainly thresholding the remaining images to validate this technique. Uh, and so we had a, a training set of about one sixth of the images and then the remainder was used as a test set. Uh, we uh, wanted to compare the effectiveness of the manual and automated methods, uh, and we looked at it three different ways, uh, two of them more qualitatively and one of them quantitatively, and we'll get into those in a moment. So the, the first, mo most basic way you can look at uh, the automated threshold method is does it make the expert happy when they go and see what these thresholds produced? And uh, the, 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 the course answer to that is yes. Um, Again, this is, I believe, the same point in uh, the same images. And uh, the, the region indicated by the arrow, the background noise there in the green channel is, is removed in a similar manner in both methods. Uh, and again, this is just sort of a quick qualitative comparison of the methods. And, uh, oh good, it's better on your screen than mine. Oh, that's the angle. Um, also wanted to take some quick uh, sanity checks on the uh, distributions, and particularly the bivariate distribution of pairwise uh, channels, red to green, green to blue, uh, and so forth. Uh, just a quick note, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, bivariate histograms of image data, this may look a little odd. That's because this is in uh, log scale probabilities, because we wanted to make sure the tails were behaving well as well. So. Uh, we had some qualitative comparisons, and uh, those were very useful. But as I said in the title, and in fact, the entire goal of this project uh, initially was to come up with some quantitative analysis. And so we also wanted a quantitative comparison of the, uh, of the methods. So in uh, conflict microscopy, uh, one, of the, one of the ways we assess uh, images and uh, the simultaneous behavior of uh, different uh, stains in this case, our different uh, colors, is with what's called uh, co-localization coefficients. Now, if you go to the statistical literature, you're not going to find these terms. Uh, but you may find something like association measures. And to give you a concrete example, uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient is something we all know and love. Um, there's also a few other coefficients of interest. And these are, these are typically available in things like image J and uh, uh, metamorph, for example. Uh, Computing them in a batch-wise process over a lot of images, though, is not, and that's, that's where some of our work came in. Uh, Manders, it's also known as the cosine similarity. Uh, take two things, imagine them as vectors, and compute the angle between them. Uh, M and K coefficients, they exist. Uh, so manual task two was, well, we need to compute coefficients on 933 images. The good news is we don't have three different channels because we're just doing all pairwise at, at once. Uh, but the problem is now we have checkboxes in a GUI instead of sliders. And once we do a single image, we then have to record the values by hand and put it in an Excel sheet or something. And it just doesn't seem, seem like the right way to go when we have automation tools like programming languages around. So uh, in this case, it was NumPy to the rescue for us. And I uh, don't want to get into this code deeply. Uh, the, the main point I want to make about it is if you look through it, it's all nice, easily available NumPy primitives. So things like dot product, square root. These things are immediately available in NumPy, and we can make very quick use of them. Uh, one note is some of the phrasing on the, the, the computation of these may look a little bit odd. Some things I factored out to the top of this loop, and that was a, a, a nice computational savings over the amount of time it was taking to use some built-in library, uh, even NumPy, SciPy library routines, because some of the same dot products were be computed, being computed over and over. Uh, yeah, so that's the rescue squad. Uh, using that, we were able to, and I do apologize, I'm, you caught me, this is from ggplot2, not from uh, matplotlib, I'm sorry. Uh, we were able to uh, quickly dump the coefficient values we computed out into a file and uh, start looking at what these, these values were. Uh, this is a, a type of plot called a strip plot. You may or may not have seen it before. Uh, you'll notice that on each of the uh, inner vertical axes, there are six uh, markers, a uh, circle, uh, triangle, or square. 
and those represent the value of the coefficient over those uh, over the six uh, replications of a particular experimental condition. So uh, that gave us uh, wonderful data to look at. And now you may say, well, are you do really doing a quantitative comparison of these quantitative values? And I'm going to I'm going to say no right now. Right now we're qualitatively looking at these quantitative values that we computed. So uh, just a few quick uh, computational notes. Almost all of this was done in uh, sort of the standard uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib stack. Uh, obviously didn't really need NumPy to do file management and, and, and file parsing and things like this. Uh, but we did use Python for that. Uh, two things that we did do in R, uh, one was to create that strip plot I showed at the end, and also the, uh, the actual fitting of the linear model from uh, extracted features to uh, expert thresholds was done in R. And uh, just a few quick uh, conclusions here. Uh, having the automated method both on an image by image basis and also batch processing over uh, almost a thousand images was uh, greatly useful to us. And it's going to be even more useful in forward going experiments, right? Here we had to do some validation. We, we paid the price now to hopefully do some validation so that on the next round, maybe we'll, maybe we'll manually threshold two out of six uh, conditions one for training, one sixth for training, one sixth for a, an intervalidation of that data set, and, and then we can go. Um, did, uh, did some sample uh, experimental conditions, viewed the, uh, had the expert uh, make biological uh, conclusions from the coefficients we computed, and it was, it was the same in both cases, both for the automated and the uh, manual methods. Uh, just some nice uh, software engineering type uh, benefits to this code. Uh, and one, one lesson I learned was that, you know, j just because, uh, you know, do, using something like SciPy spatial stats uh, correlation to compute something, it, it ends up taking a little while. And then when you throw more coefficient computations on top of that, it's, it ends up sort of adding up linearly, right? Because you're computing one, then the other, then the other. If you can factor out some of the common work, this, this isn't a big surprise, if you can factor out some of the common work, bang, all of a sudden you've, you, you, you get some very nice speed ups. Um, uh, one other really uh, sort of nice scientific uh, piece out of this project was the, the co-localization coefficient literature does not typically have a uniform way of describing the coefficients. They're sort of idiosyncratic summation notation to just get it out there and get it done. Um, writing the code for some performance sake required going back, uh, sort of hacking the summations down to uh, their raw pieces and saying, oh, dot product here, dot product here, same dot product, wonderful, and, and then being able to make use of those. But that taught us a lot about the, 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 stru the mathematical structure of computing these coefficients, and we're hoping that that can give us some insight into how to deal with uh, triple label uh, coefficients directly. That is, a, a coefficient that would express red, green, and blue all simultaneously, as opposed to doing red within certain, I'm sorry, green, blue within certain conditions of red, and so forth and so on. Uh, thank you very much. On GitHub, my user is mthunner1. This is under pycolocutils, and the full URL is there. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I'm not familiar with those methods uh, by name. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, a gentleman was asking how uh, this method of automatically computing thresholds compares with some other uh, particular methods that I presume are used in other co-localization or other microscopy uh, software suites. Um, my, my best answer to that is number one, I don't know specifically. Uh, number two is that I do know that there are some current concerns with using uh, sort of pre-canned uh, thresholding methods uh, because in many cases those are optimized for giving you a good visual display, sort of a, a pretty uh, display for publication and some of the biological conclusions you may or may not uh, get the same. I, I don't know if that's the case with the methods you're referring to. And number three is and something I had as I was sitting here uh, waiting to give the talk was well, even if some methods are better for visual purposes and less for biological, we could use the same framework to compare them. And we could see if we're getting things that would make the expert happy, even if it's a completely pre-canned method. I'd love to talk to you more about uh, 
those after the talk. The, the lightning talk? Yeah. I, I did not. Oh. I, was, I was mellowing beforehand. What are your thoughts about, uh, so this talk is basically about factoring out little pieces that, that aren't specific to your domain, but that are generally useful. Kind of okay, uh, from a software engineering standpoint? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, someone, uh, I think Stefan might have mentioned it, he's not here. Oh, he is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I was, of course, it couldn't be right beside the person I was talking to. That'd be improbable. Um, uh, he mentioned uh, scikit images. And I had not been, I was not thinking in scikit terms when we were developing this. And of course, scikit images is a moving target. It's developing uh, along with everything else. But uh, definitely want to see if there are pieces out of there that I could pull in to reduce some of my legwork. Uh, I was using uh, uh, Pill for a lot of my image lifting, and maybe psychic images would have some work there. I, if some of my methods could make it into psychic images, that'd be awesome. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know exactly what Matt was saying uh, about factoring, uh, but yeah, having, having small reusable pieces, I'm, I'm a Unix fanboy, I guess, and uh, you know, I believe in that design philosophy of uh, small things that do the job right and then get out of your way. Thank you.